Would you stand please and take your Bible and turn to the book of 2 Timothy tonight uh, for our scripture reading time, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, we're going to preach tonight just from a few verses, and uh, I uh, am excited about finishing 2 Timothy possibly by the end of the year. This spring we've had several special uh, services in the evening and so forth, and so uh, we've not been able to get as many as I had originally planned, but the Lord has been working. We've had some great uh, messages messages from guest speakers and other uh, topics of revival. And so tonight we want to come back to 2 Timothy, which is our Sunday night study, and look at verse, chapter 2, verses 16 and 19. Now, about five years ago, I began preaching with an iPad. And tonight, this iPad resembles your pastor in that it's almost out of battery. <laughs> I have never stood before to preach with 14% of battery on an iPad, so I have no idea uh, how long it's going to go. Uh, hopefully, some of you are saying, yes, run out, run out. And, and I, know, I just know some of you too well, you know, so I don't, I don't plan to preach long anyways, but if it gets real, if I just like wrap it up real quick, you'll know exactly what happened, right? Uh, but uh, 2 Timothy, for, for the first year when I preached from the iPad, I always brought a paper outline with me because I was so afraid the devil was going to possess this iPad, you know, and something bad was going to happen. I was going to lose my whole sermon. So, uh, but anyways, I don't have a backup tonight. So 2 Timothy chapter 2. I've entitled this message, Strengthened in Discernment. Strengthened in Discernment. Folks, if we ever needed discernment, uh, it's today. And my, my heart is so heavy and full, and, and I, I don't consider myself a prophet, but I, I see a lot of trends, and uh, just even some things in the paper today about various denominations and where things are heading. And, uh, and, and we as God's people today need discernment to understand the times. And so uh, here's, a, here's a portion of Scripture that deals with that. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity." So let's pray and let's dive into this passage tonight. Father, thank you for the wonderful spirit and privilege that we really have just to gather here, Lord. And I know that this is Father's Day and, and uh, we're beginning the summer months. And, and yet, Lord, I pray that in every service this summer that we would just get something that really helps us spiritually. And Lord, may, may that begin right here and right now is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, the Apostle Paul has been instructing Timothy in some very basic areas of pastoral leadership. He has been challenging him uh, in his responsibility to warn uh, the churches, such as the church at Ephesus, and to be strong with them in warning them. And also he had been challenging, them, uh, challenging him in his responsibility to study the Word of God. And that's where we left off some weeks back. Notice verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why I love Brother Lester's little book on how to study the Bible, because God's word challenges us to study and to be in the word of God. So, so Paul the apostle has been challenging uh, Timothy to be a leader in the church that would step up and warn the church. And he told him in chapter two here in the early portion, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And he was just challenging Timothy to be a strong leader Leader, and then to be a studious leader, right? And you know the context of 2 Timothy, for those that weren't here some months ago. Uh, this is the last will and testament of the Apostle Paul. This is being written from the prison in Rome. He's giving his last instructions to a young preacher, and he's saying, Timothy, I want to challenge you to warn the flock, and I want to challenge you to teach the flock. And, and the Bible is so very clear along those lines. In fact, it says we're to preach the word, we're to be instant in season, out of season, we're to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And folks, we live in a day where everyone wants exhortation. Nobody wants to be uh, reproved or rebuked. 
rebuked. And, and, and how many of you would say, Pastor, I just pray for you that God will give you the balance for what we need in our Christian life because uh, preaching requires the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was challenging Timothy with this along the way. But tonight, as we look at this particular text, he is moving from just warning and teaching to challenging and showing Timothy how to specifically deal with specific problems that may arise in the church. In other words, it's easy to talk about uh, false teaching in general, uh, but it is quite a different thing if something's actually in the flock and it needs to be dealt with. And this is the case, and Paul's going to use two men as an illustration tonight uh, in this passage. And so let's dive into this and let's notice, first of all, if you're taking notes, the danger of vain words. The danger of vain words. Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto the more ungodliness. So in verse 15, he says, study the word, study the word of God. In verse 16, he says, but, but stay away from all the gobbledygook that's out there. Now, how many of you know there's a lot of spiritual books on the market? How many of you have figured that out? There's a lot of books about uh, spirituality that have nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with Jesus Christ, who is the foundation of truth. We know the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so as he's telling Timothy, now study to show yourself approved unto God. He also says here, shun. He says, I want you to study, verse 15, but verse 16, I want you to shun. Now, in your life and in my life, I mean, we have to learn what to let in and what not to let in. How many of you have figured out you only have so many hours in a day? How many of you have figured out you only have so much brain capacity? I mean, we haven't tapped it all yet, but go with me on this one right here, right? How many of you realize there's only so much you can memorize in a given lifetime or a given day? So... We are the guardians, the Bible says, uh, that we are to uh, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, we're to renew our minds through the Word of God. So we're the guardians of what comes in and what doesn't come in. So Paul says, Timothy, study the Word, but shun profane and vain babblings. And the word shun means to turn away from. And Paul is warning uh, Timothy, and he's warned him time and time again about this. In 2 Timothy 2.14, strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of hearers. 2 Timothy 2.16, shun profane and vain babblings. 2.23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Now, let's, let's look at the definition of vain words. When he says uh, shun profane and vain babblings, what is he talking about? He's talking about ungodly words. The word, uh, the word of profane speaks of uh, unholy or unhallowed words. Uh, here's an illustration. Turn in your Bible, please, to Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29. And here's a great verse that we often uh, use even in marital counseling, but it applies to this moment as well on profane words. It says in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So God commands us to take in the good, but to shun the bad. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Colossians 4.6, Let your speech be always seasoned with grace. Now, folks, our goal should be that when we're having conversation with someone, that they are richer spiritually for it, that they are uplifted spiritually for it, and, uh, and, and we are to use words that are not vain, but words that are full and words that are edifying. So he says, shun profane. And then notice also in verse 16, this next word, he says, profane, and he says, and vain babblings. Now, we don't say those words a lot. You don't go up to your wife tomorrow and say, Honey, I've noticed that your speech has been full of vain babblings in recent days. If you have said that in, 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 in lately, tell me after church. I just want to know what kind of person says that. And I'm certainly not making fun of the teachings of the Word of God. I actually like it, vain babblings. I mean, it does make sense. Empty, the word vain, speaks of empty noise. So he says, shun empty noise. Now, I'm not being critical when I say this, but sometimes someone will come to you and they might be talking even about spiritual things, and about 30 minutes later, you're just going, what's he saying? What is this? It's empty noise. 
And Paul says, Timothy, as a leader, you're going to have to learn you can't waste your life on empty noise. Study the word, but shun profane and vain babblings, these that have no substance or value to them. Empty words soon become evil words because empty words are like a vacuum. Whatever gets near the vacuum rushes into the vacuum, and empty words become evil words because they suck up sin. And I believe the context would indicate that empty and vain conversations can lead to idleness or gossip and things that are not profitable. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, you got to learn what to hear, what to say, and how to discipline your words. You see, all of us would be wiser if we would resolve never to put people down except on our prayer lists, rather than get involved in empty and vain babblings. Now, in a moment, we're going to see Paul name some names, but you'll see why. There's a, there's a doctrinal matter here. But the fact is that vain and babblings, just talking about people and talking about this and that, he says, Timothy, stay away from that, the definition of vain words. But I want you to notice the destruction of these words, the destruction of vain words. Now, we've all read in the book of James where the Bible says the tongue is like a fire and how the tongue can start uh, and destroy But notice what this passage says here. It says, shun profane and vain babblings. Why? For they will increase unto more, what's the next word say? Ungodliness. So there are certain people that that tend to discuss things in a certain way, and over time it just trends to more ungodliness. Pretty soon they're on social media and they're kind of winking and laughing at subtle innuendo. They're giving credence to divisive Uh, talk, and soon they're becoming critical outright of others and so forth. It becomes, it it goes from just being empty babble uh, to literally becoming destructive to our faith and destructive to our walk with the Lord. 2 Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible tells us that evil men and seducers will wax worse and and worse. In other words, this idea of deceitful ministry is not going to get less in the last days. And, and I, I've seen people that get involved in vain babbling and talking with what they think are some gloriously great Christians, and pretty soon, I mean, their, their marriage is hurting, their life's testimony is hurting, sometimes they're doing incredibly rash and sinful things, all, all of it starting with vain babblings and acting very spiritual, like, hey, this is all really good, and I have this really great understanding of things now, and, and really, uh, what you can often see is that someone's life is not matching what they're saying in their words. Vain babblings do not produce godly living. The Bible tells us here, they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, folks, listen to me. Your talk talks, and your walk walks, uh, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. So people that want to talk uh, you know, about this or that, or they want to talk uh, you know, negatively about this person or that person. That's, that's one thing. But sometimes, and what I've done over the years, because sometimes even, even in situations I've had to try to assess, I can't tell who's right or who's wrong. I just go, Lord, you know. You know what one of my tests is? Let's just see who's in church singing to Jesus a few years from now. Because usually, when someone truly loves the Lord, they're going to be found faithful at the end of that trial. And, and here, here we see that the wrong kinds of conversations can really increase to what the Bible calls ungodliness, which means, of course, a lack of reverence to God. So more ungodliness and then expanded corruption. Look at verse 17. It says this, and their word, not, not capital W, but their word, their language, the things they're saying, will eat as doth a canker, Right? And sometimes people just say things negatively, and, the, and, and it'll just get into your soul. And, and it just kind of eats like a canker, like it troubles someone. Now, this is interesting. The word eat uh, speaks of just an increased uh, presence uh, as, uh, as a cow is eating in the pasture. And the word canker, this is interesting. Uh, it is the word from which we get the word gangrene. So it eats it, it like a canker, like gangrene, or like a serious infection. Now, I have watched younger Christians get involved in church, 
And then some kind of a loose-lipped, vain, babbling type of person just say something, oh, you know, and, and it could be, listen, it could be from either extreme. It could be, it could be poly Pharisee telling this brand new Christian, well, you ought to do this differently. It could be, uh, you know, hyper grace over on this side telling someone, you can do whatever you want to do. Don't let them tell you what to do. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what extreme it comes from. But when someone with this kind of babbling mentality kind of throws out this to a new Christian, it many times discourages them. So on the one time, on the pharisaical side, they're feeling like they've been judged. And by the way, the Holy Spirit will do a better job of that than you can do. So let them grow in grace. On the other side, someone says, you can do whatever you want. That confuses them because they're going, well, I thought I got saved so I'd be different. So that confuses them. And what happens is this new Christian, it's like a canker inside of them. It's like gangrene. And, and I watch it as a pastor, and they begin to limp. They, they, they were coming right into church and enjoy it. They were coming into your Sunday school class and enjoy it. But certain things are said, and it just causes them to limp. Now, if I sense that soon enough, I'll try to do my best to go to them or have a teacher go to them and love and say, listen, don't, don't let what someone said hurt you. Let us give you this scripture here, and let's take the word of God, and let's surgically extract that canker so that gangrene doesn't set in, so that you don't lose your heart, your joy, your life. Folks, please always remember in what you say, the littlest things of what we say can discourage or encourage people in their faith. And so uh, we see that ungodliness comes, expanded corruption can come, and ultimately even false doctrine can come. Look at verse 18, what it says. Who concerning the truth, he's mentioned two names, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. Now, this is kind of amazing, but these men were so involved in just babbling along and babbling along it wasn't enough just to maybe talk you know, on the low down about things. They wanted to get into being some kind of uh, teacher themselves, even to the place of saying, we well, you know the resurrection's happened already. Now talk about discouraging a new believer. They're going, it did? I'm still here? And, and in fact, it says that in verse 18. And, and it says, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, we can assume here that these people that Paul named were quite familiar to Timothy and to the church of Ephesus as well. And Paul had told Timothy previously to warn Hymenus. Now, you know, we very rarely have stood up in the pulpit here in 32 years, and I don't remember too many times, if any, where we said a name unless someone was repenting of sin publicly. But, but several times over the years, I've gone to an individual uh, and just said, and some of our deacons or staff have gone and said, look, you know, you're saying these things and it's hurtful to the body, and we're asking you now to stop saying those things. And certainly if someone started saying something like, hey, the rapture already happened, or the Bible's not really the word of God, or, you know, whatever doctrinal error, we would definitely confront that very quickly. We had times, I remember the old building, we used to have this false cult, the Filipino cult, the Iglesia Ni Cristo come, and they tried to argue with our members, and they tried to tell people that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, and so forth. And I remember just going out there and saying, hey, this is private property, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, whether you understand it or not. Uh, he, is, uh, he is fully God and fully man. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's what the Bible says. That's what we believe. If you have questions about it, come on in. We'll talk to you. If you're going to stand out here and argue with our new Christians about it, there's the door. You can leave right now. You say, well, that was me. No, that's not me. That's being a shepherd. Sometimes a shepherd has to sense if there's a wolf and he has to take care of it. Now, remember the context of this. Paul, the apostle's dying. Timothy is the under-shepherd who's going to watch over these churches. And Paul's saying, Timothy, now you watch out for Hymenus and Philetus because they've passed this kind of babbling stage, and they're getting into the heresy stage. In fact, I'm just going to put their name in the letter here to you so that you'll really remember the destruction that they can bring. Uh, turn back a couple pages to 1 Timothy 1.19, and remember what was said there. Just to refresh your memory, it says, holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and, uh, and Alexander whom I have already delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme whoa 
the Apostle Paul said, these people have blasphemed the truth of God's word. I'm just going to let them uh, be given over. Satan's going to bring all kinds of havoc in their life, and they'll learn not to blaspheme. And so here we see the severity of it. Paul knew these men and had cast one out of the church, but the false teaching had continued. So he's telling Timothy, deal with this. So we see here the false teachers, and then we see that flagrant apostasy that is mentioned. The Bible says here, in this passage, that they have erred, verse number 18. And that means that they had deviated, they had missed the mark. Now folks, we have a very, uh, a, a very foundational doctrinal statement in our church. We give it to every new member. I try to preach through the major doctrines over the course of a year. I try to preach about heaven. I try to preach about hell. I try to preach about the deity of Christ. I try to preach about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I try to preach about the doctrine of salvation. And by the way, at Lancaster Baptist Church, we still believe in whosoever will. We believe, according to 1 John chapter 2, that Jesus died for all men, not just some men, not just a few men. And we've preached that for 30 two years. Whosoever will may come. And we try to preach the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of heaven and hell, all these different things, uh, the doctrine of the end times. Uh, And as we teach and preach these, if there would be someone that would come and oppose that, if they had a question, we'd help them. But if it's just for the sake of drawing people away, Paul's saying, Timothy, you've got to deal with that. That's not something that you sit around and uh, and that you want to talk about. Now, we are at 5% battery, praise the Lord. Let us continue. Notice the false teaching that they gave specifically. The Bible, here, the Bible tells us what they were saying, verse 18. The resurrection is past already. So they were teaching that the rapture perhaps had even taken place, or more likely that the resurrection was only spiritual and that there would be no physical resurrection. We don't know exactly what they were saying, but it may have also been a form of what was called Gnosticism. Gnosticism was prevalent in the first century. This belief in Gnosticism, the Gnostics, they believed that there was a God, but you couldn't really know him. And they believed that the resurrection may have been more spiritual than physical, and yet the Bible speaks of a bodily and literal rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 16 says it this way. If the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you are yet in your sins. So to say that there was no resurrection was heretical and Timothy's being challenged to deal with that straight on. And uh, in fact, notice also what it says here in verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and have overthrown the faith of some. Now, pastor, why would we confront false teachers so strongly? Why? Because when vain babbling starts and when it elevates even to questioning the Bible, if it's not dealt with, It causes young Christians to err in their faith. It causes them to waver in their faith. And so the Word of God must be preached, and the Word of God must be defended. The Bible says that we are to earnestly, say it with me, contend for the faith. Now, I'm telling you, there's a whole brand of Christians out there today that do not like it when a pastor's contending for the faith. Preach about it, teach about it, but if you get into the tone of, hey, this is what God says, and we're going to stand on it, and so on and so forth, sometimes folks kind of, you know, go back at that, but we're commanded uh, to hold to the faith, contend to the faith. 1 Timothy 4 and 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and to the doctrines of devils. 2 Peter 2 and 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets and teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And again, I'm not trying to be, you know, Mr. Prophet, and I'm not going to get into a lot of the details tonight, but I really believe there's a lot of false teaching entering into evangelicalism today. There's acceptance of various faiths that's more of an ecumenicism, and we just need to have discernment. The Bible says in Philippians 1, I taught, I taught a, probably a three-hour lesson to the pastors this past week, Philippians 1, where it says, let your, abound, let your love abound with knowledge and judgment, how that we need discernment in these last days so that we don't put our love on, a, on certain things that is not uh, truly according to the Word of God. So there's the danger of vain words. And, and Paul says, Timothy, be careful when there's just a lot of chatterboxing going on. Be careful that that could even lead to false teaching. But notice, secondly, if you would, there's the safety 
of the truth. Someone says, whoa, I don't want to get involved in vain babbling or false doctrine. What do I do? Well, you run to the truth. And notice what it says in verse 19 now. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. So here we see a strong foundation. It is the foundation of God. It is the professing church of Jesus Christ, and it standeth sure. The church that Jesus Christ has founded will remain despite the efforts of Satan. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Matthew 16, 18, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Spurgeon said, All that God has built upon the foundation which he himself has laid keeps its place. Not one living stone that he ever laid upon the foundation has been lifted from its resting place. By the way, we are the living stones. And we have been placed strategically upon the solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 and 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Hey, listen tonight. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. The, the prophets have laid the foundation uh, and the apostles with their teaching. And you and I like living stones have been placed one stone at a time into this spiritual house called the church and we have a strong foundation and yes the culture's changing yes there's compromise and heresy that is abounding but if we will keep ourselves on the solid rock we'll be just fine just fine call it the fundamentals of our faith Call it a sure foundation. Call it what you want. But we've got to stay with the truth of the Word of God. A strong foundation. But not only do we have a strong foundation, but also as we think about safety, not only do we have the strong foundation of a biblical church, but we have a sure relationship. So look at what it says in verse 19. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Now, the word seal means an impression made by a signet ring. And the church of Jesus Christ has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And boy, you just can't get enough of this. And I want you to open your Bible to Ephesians 1.13, just real quickly, because I'm probably at about 3% right now. So Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, all right? And I want you to see this because we have a seal. We have been sealed. And I'm thankful for this, that, that those of us that are saved were a part of a living house called the church, and we have a lively seal by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13, in whom also ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. Now, no one gets saved apart from the word of truth. I remember, Brother Tierney, when I was going to your house a few times when you were saved and coming back to Romans 10.17 and asking you. I said, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you're hearing these truths now. And are you ready to act upon those truths? And, and I think that's key for all of us as we've been saved. It comes back to hearing the word of truth. So it says here, in whom you trusted. Well, when did someone trust Christ as their Savior? After they heard. In other words, no one is saved without hearing the word of truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's what it says here. In whom also, also ye uh, trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, notice this next phrase, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now, if you were going to buy a house, you would go into the realtor's office or the title's office. And you would write a check, and you'd write a check for five or ten thousand dollars, and you would sign your name, and uh, those documents would be sealed and stamped by a notary. And what does that mean? It means this is our down payment, and we fully intend to purchase this, even as the Bible says here, until the redemption of the purchase possession. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit sealed you, and God says you are sealed until Jesus Christ comes again and claims and redeems his purchased possession, and we are the purchased possession. We are the bride of Jesus Christ, and we have been bought with the blood of Jesus and sealed by the very presence of the Holy Spirit, and no matter what's going on in this world, no one can take your salvation from you. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And there is safety in being a part of a church that is built on Jesus Christ, the sure foundation, and knowing that you're saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. So we see the danger of vain words. 
They can even lead to false teaching. And we see the safety of salvation in Christ and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me so far? All right, let's look at the third thought tonight. The responsibility of the saved. So, what is our responsibility then as we stand here tonight on the truth of God? Well, notice verse 19 again. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, before I jump right over it, how many of you are glad the Lord knoweth everyone that is his? That is awesome. I don't know what you're going to face this week. We've got some dear members with doctor's appointments, but let me just tell you this. He knows your name. And he knows what you're going through. And he loves you individually. But God speaks beyond that, beyond the relationship. And I want you to notice as we close the responsibility of the saved. First of all, notice the description that is given to us here in verse 19. He says, he says The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So notice this word nameth. Every one of us that, this word nameth means that professes. Now, how many of you are professing Christians tonight? Okay. We profess the name of Jesus Christ. This term refers to all of us who profess Jesus, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name whereby we must be saved. So the description then is the believer. That's who's in mind here. The believer. Every one of us that names Jesus, but notice the duty that we have. What is our duty according to verse 19? Every one of you that nameth the name of Christ, notice this now, depart from iniquity. The word depart means to shun, to flee, to run from it. Whether that is iniquity that is vain babbling, that is gossip, that is tearing down, that is casting doubt, that is bringing canker, or even false doctrine, God says, I want you to turn from that. I want you to depart from that and to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 1 Peter 1.15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy for I am holy. Positionally, we are dead, in, uh, dead indeed unto sin, Romans chapter 6. But then Paul said something so strange. He said, I die daily. He said, I reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto Jesus Christ. And so my responsibility is to live out my identity each and every day. It is to live out my identity as a child of God it is to flee from that which is false teaching. It, it is my duty to depart from that which would canker my heart and damage my spiritual progress. It is my duty to separate from that which would contaminate. And so God has given us tonight the danger of vain words. And he says very clearly, shun them, stay away from them. And he tells us the safety of the truth. Build your life on the sure foundation, Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone, and, and know that you're sealed under the day of your redemption. But remember your responsibility. Remember that you have a responsibility, and that is to depart from iniquity. Timothy, I want you to put the church in mind of these things, and may we be mindful of them this summer. Let's be careful of the wrong kinds of words. Let's build our lives on the truth of Jesus Christ, and let's remember our responsibility to depart from iniquity, and to live a godly testimony. Folks, we don't have time to make a list of 1,018 rules for your you know, homecoming party or your class reunion. I pray that if you go to something like that, that you'll stand for Jesus, depart from iniquity, standing on the firm foundation of Jesus, and have a testimony of all the great things that God has done for you. God help us to live out for Him this summer. Let me ask you a question, friend. Are you avoiding this matter of vain babbling? Is there a conversation or a chat room or a Facebook page that maybe you need to turn off? It's just taking you nowhere. Have you thanked the Lord lately for the security of your salvation, and are you building on the solid rock of Jesus Christ? And are you in your everyday life letting the Holy Spirit turn you away from iniquity and toward the holiness of God. It's a wonderful Christian life 
when we just simply live it according to the leading of His Spirit and according to the leading of His book. Let's stand together.